All right, welcome to the Coder Kids podcast, episode number 29. Jeff Ward and James Thornock are the hosts. That's us. Thanks hey for guys. coming again. Today we have just the coolest well i don't know everybody's the coolest recently man we've had some great guests so if you haven't listened to some of the other recent ones go back listen to those but allison master phd she is um well you're gonna find out a little bit more because jeff introduced her um when the segment actually comes up but jeff tell me a little bit about yourself what's been going on with you uh you know i don't think i've given this update maybe i have but i did finish reading a book Nice. And it's a, it's a, it's funny because I don't know. I feel like talking to Allison today, she's so smart. She does all this research, but you know, we all need to take a, we all need to take a second sometimes and read a, a good book that you just get through. And this one was a very punchable face by Colin Jost. I finished it. It was, what good. was it about? I have no idea. Uh, well, Colin Jost is the anchor to weekend update on Saturday night live. Okay. So he does like some comedy stuff and um, it's basically just a memoir. So he just tells stories about himself and like times that he was in Europe and people threw vegetables at him and like when he accidentally pooped his pants, you know, just little things like that. Nice. It's like funny stories basically. So, nice. um, but it, it's a good, it's a good read. I mean, definitely not serious. So nice. it's not well, a, political read or anything james what's what's new with you yeah dude so my son he turned one year old uh on wednesday yeah, so, congratulations um yeah happy his, birthday to him his birthday is 2 10 2020 so it's kind of pretty easy birthday to remember thank goodness oh yeah i'm not good at remembering birthdays but um he's he's walking around man it's it's wild like you have to go through several stages of childproofing, right, Jeff? And I am, we, we're having to upgrade. <laughs> so um, that's it. That's All right. awesome. Well, we're, we're excited about this interview, James. It was a great one. Um, we don't, James said that we can't call her Dr. Master because she gets mad and she thinks it sounds like an evil villain. <laughs> so it's she, Allison Master. Yeah. She's James. awesome. Yeah, and she's got a good sense of humor, too. So, all right, we're going to transition three, two, one. All right, welcome to the interview portion of our Coder Kids podcast. Today, we're really excited to have Allison Master with us. Allison is an assistant professor at the University of Houston College of Education. She specializes in, well, I'm trying to sum it up, but she specializes in identity and its impact on academic motivation. We'll be diving deeper into her research topics during the podcast, but these are some examples that I came up with of topics that she has researched. Cultural stereotypes and why gender gaps exist in software and computer engineering. Uh, how positive affirmation can impact student achievement in different cultural groups. Helping students stay motivated when they're struggling in school. Uh, Allison holds a bachelor's degree from Yale University in psychology and a master's and PhD in developmental psychology from Stanford University, where she studied under Carol Dweck, the world-renowned author of Mindset. And I'm sure she's done a lot of other great research as well, uh, but that's the book I know her by. Um, so with that, we'd like to welcome Allison Master to our podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Ah, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, um, James, I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you and you can kick it off with, uh, with uh, the, first, the, topic. the first big question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, before before I do that, I do have to just point out those who are listening to the podcast, not watching. Allison has an excellently organized bookshelf in rainbow order. So you got to check out the YouTube video. It's beautiful. So check that out. Yes. Um, and Carol Dweck's book is right there. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, all right. So <laughs> now to the serious stuff. You know, as you know, we run after school programs and summer camps based around technology and specifically coding. Um, it was originally you that reached out to us. Um, goodness, it was a while ago. Do you remember when that was? Probably about a year ago, I think. Yeah, I feel like that's right. And, uh, you know, asked if we might be interested in doing a little bit of research. So that's kind of what started things. Um, since we've started tracking this data, uh, which has been several years, right, Jeff? Something like three, yeah. four years? Yeah, three or four years. Um, yeah. We've had almost exactly 75% boys 
and 25% girls register in our classes. Um, so for those who are not familiar with your research, can you break down this phenomenon of why girls are generally less inclined to become coders compared with their male peers? And um, maybe you can give us a grade too. Like, are we, are we, are we better, worse, or, or average? Above. You're okay. ahead of the curve a little bit. I think if you look at like um, the percent of women who major in computer science in mm. college, it's about 18 or 19 percent right now. So you're okay. like six percent above that. So that's pretty good. Um, well, and I will, I will throw into those statistics. One, one statistic I don't have is like. What does it look like for the younger classes versus the older classes? And I know we'll dive into that mm. a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. Because I'm sure that the, I mean, some of our younger classes have to be like 50 50. But anyway, Allison, I'd yeah. love to get your opinion yeah. on. That's what my guess would be. I mean, so we've surveyed seeing? kids about, you know, how interested they are in computer science. So we did a big survey with like first graders through 12th graders. And it really seems like the gender gaps show up most strongly in middle school. Like right around seventh grade, we saw girls mm. take a Yep, in their interest in coding. Um, so I, that's why I think elementary school is such a great time to get girls interested in coding and give them those experiences because they're, they're not so aware of the stereotypes yet. So a lot of my research focuses on like these stereotypes and these beliefs we have about who likes to do computer science, who's good at computer science, and how those sort of create a barrier for girls that kind of pushes them away from computer science and coding. And so a lot of my research focuses on how that happens and maybe what we could do to, to counteract that and stop that and help get girls more interested in computer coding. And so we've done research like with um, first grade girls. We, we did a study where we had them like programming robots with us and we found that we, we had two groups of kids. So we had one group who got to program and play with these robots. And then we had another group of kids who didn't get to do that. And all we did was just ask them like, how much do you like robots? How good do you think you would be at programming robots? And for the ones who hadn't had any experience, um, we found a gender gap. So the girls didn't think they'd be as good. They weren't as interested in it. But when we actually gave kids that experience, and it wasn't a big thing, it was like 20 minutes playing with these robots. Um, and then after that, we found there was no gender gap at all. So when girls actually get these experiences at a young age, they really enjoy it. Like they like coding just as much as boys do when they actually try it. They just sort of, when they don't get these experiences, they're forced to rely on these stereotypes that they pick up from our culture. And that sort of sends them this message that, coding is for boys, it's not something that girls like to do, and that's what sort of pushes them away. And it seems like middle school is really a time when that's that happens the most strongly. I actually yeah, want gonna, to follow up no, with ahead, a quick Jim. question, Jeff. This one, like, this is actually the last question I wrote, but like, it applies directly to what you're talking about now. So I read that paper, it was in 2017 you published this, is that right? Yeah, right. So y'all can look it up, we'll provide links so you can read this stuff. Um, this paper I think is open to the public because I was able to click on it without paying. So, um, so that, that is, uh, that's good. You can check it out. There's also videos that you can watch of like the experiment actually happening. So that's sometimes neat when you, cause sometimes the, you know, you hear about research and you're like, well, how exactly was it conducted? You know, like, what was it like? And here you can actually see that. So you have these kids, they, they rate, like their own interest, right? And then they, um, they also, they rate, they rate, like, do you think girls or boys are better? And then there's the third thing, which I thought was really interesting, which is like, how confident are they that, um, like they're good at it or that th they're, pr they're proficient at, at it. And, and that r reminded me of another podcast by uh, Tim Harford called Cautionary Tales. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. And he talked about there's this phenomenon that happens where, um, ad like, full-grown adults, right, where we rate our own knowledge on average as much higher the, the understanding of, uh, of a subject, especially political topics like cap-and-trade or immigration policy or school choice or whatever. So if someone says, you know, hey, James, you know, what do you feel about cap and trade? And then it'd be like, you know, it's either good or bad. And then, and then they'd say, okay, um, what's your understanding of the subject? And you'd, you'd give it a, like a, typically the answers were like seven to 10. And then 
they'd ask you to explain like what you meant and then people would like almost invariably unless they were an expert on the subject like they would invariably rate themselves lower after they had to ex- actually explain it so um <laughs> so in the in the subject of the podcast, he was talking about how to increase curiosity and and kind of bridge the political divide that we're definitely experiencing in this country and and um, and so I thought that was great. But as applied to these kids, I'm almost wondering is there a, is there a possible influence where these boys just are like overconfident? They like they think like oh yeah I can do anything, and so of course I can do coding because like. If I'm being completely honest, I think I can do anything with with enough time, and I, I really don't doubt myself at all. I don't have like any kind of imposter syndrome, uh, syndrome, even though like perhaps I should. Uh, is is there an effect on the data because of that? Or anyway, so that's the question. If you can decipher it, is there yes. is there <laughs> is like they're just ignorance and boys the, that they just the think they can do anything. Code. Right. So if boys are seem to be more confident in something than girls, is it that girls are underconfident or boys are overconfident? Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. I think it could definitely be a little of both too. Okay. So there's a study I really like um, by Andre Simpi and he's at New York University and they did a study with six year olds on like gender stereotypes about who's really, really smart. Mm. And they found that, you know, already at like age six, kids have this perception that boys are more likely to be really smart than girls are. And the, but if you actually look at their data, it's that girls are sort of neutral on this. They're like, all right, girls or boys could be equally smart, which is a great attitude to have. It's very egalitarian. But the problem Mm -hmm. is that these boys are over here saying, oh no, it's gotta be the boys who are really, really smart. So in that case, Mm -hmm. it's really like a, you're like an in-group bias kind of overconfidence kind of thing. It's interesting because the girls are giving the actual intelligent response. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's great that's so true i did have another another follow-up question which is um i'm also wondering about fear of failure and i'm wondering about that in the context of um, you know i know you did some of this research at a non-necessarily public school but um a lot of the kids that we you know work with the first time they've ever taken an after school program or a summer camp they're super afraid to like mess up and we have to unteach that, right? Like we have to say, hey, you're gonna you're gonna hit roadblocks. There's gonna be things you don't know how to do. And like that's totally fine. And there's no grades in this class. So you know, what we're trying to do is build something and you're gonna hit a lot of, you know, problems and we're here to help you out and your classmates are here to help you out. And you guys can share ideas and cheat off of each other. They always get a rise out of that, you know. They're like we can cheat and they like get all hushed and they they get these like beady little eyes they're like oh yeah we can (laughs) and um that's so funny and we say yeah like that's part of the the process here and um yeah it's very play based and, and and creation based and so could again i'm just inferring the moon in here but like could a fear of failure also prevent like um rating yourself highly at proficiency because like when i say i could do anything like i could be president of the united states what i mean is that if you give me like a decade to prep and you know and figure it out that i could do it not that like i'm gonna do it tomorrow and yet i'm going to say it with the same certainty because i totally believe that i can but there's different assumptions. Like I'm assuming that there's time that um, you're giving me the opportunity to fit, like try and fail. And so anyway. Yeah. Okay. So I have a few thoughts in sure. response to that. All right. So one is that um, there's some really interesting research in psychology about like people going out and applying for jobs based on their qualifications. And there's research that men will apply for a job if they meet maybe like 60% of the qualifications and women will only apply for the job if they meet 100% of the qualifications. So it's clear like we've somehow socialized it into girls and women that they have to, you know, overachieve basically, that they have to be extremely qualified. Whereas I think boys and men are much more comfortable, you know, going after things, even if, 
it's more of a long shot if it's more of a risk for them, maybe. So mm. maybe fear of failure and risk taking are sort of similar things. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is that, well, now it's a perfect time to talk about growth mindsets because if you're if you're afraid of failure, then what you need is the growth mindset. So I don't know how familiar your, your listeners are, but so this is based mostly on the research of Carol Dweck and her colleagues. And growth mindset is the is the um, idea that abilities can be improved with like with effort or with the right kind of strategies mm -hmm. and that's in contrast to the fixed mindset which is that you know characteristics and abilities you know they just are what they are you're either smart or you're not smart you're not going to be able to change that but the the growth mindset is just it's a really simple idea but it's really beautiful and like the way it applies to so many different things so you know for one thing it says if you fail, if you make a mistake, that's okay because it's not the end of the story. It's like, it's the beginning of the story. You're just mm -hmm. learning. It's okay to make mistakes. Like that's exactly how you learn. That's how you grow. You don't have to worry that like making one mistake means that you're never gonna get it. You're never gonna be good at it because there's so much potential. There's so much future. And Carol talks about it as the power of the word yet. Like think about saying, I can't do this versus I can't do this yet. And just yeah. that one little word, you know, it changes the whole situation and gives you so much more hope that, you know, that you can change things and get better. So I, and I think growth mindset is really important for coding because as you guys were saying, like, you're going to make mistakes and there's going to be a learning curve and you might start out feeling like you don't know what's going on at all. And you need, you know, to be able to persist through that feeling and know that things are going to get better. Yeah, I think that's, that's really fantastic insight. And definitely something that I've noticed. And I know James, we notice it like every day. It's, it's crazy that they come into these classes and it's interesting. Some of them come in with extreme confidence. Oh yeah. I, I know that I'll be able to do this. And then others come in so afraid to fail. And I, I mean, I noticed it as a classroom teacher a lot as well. The fear of even raising your hand and getting a math question wrong. Um, it's really interesting. Do you have any thoughts on like, why, and I, I shouldn't just call it public schools. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of our traditional education system, but like why that fear of failure in both genders is present. Um, like why we haven't overcome that yet. Uh, that's a hard question. I don't know if I can answer that question <laughs> in particular. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, the focus on like high stakes standardized testing, I think has been really yeah on students and on mm. teachers too, because it makes everyone worried about performance, which is, you know, if you're in a fixed mindset, that's what you're worried about is you have to like prove that you're smart. You have to do really well on the test and it puts a lot of pressure on you. And, you know, when you're feeling that kind of pressure, it's harder to perform. It's harder to focus because you've got all this other stuff going on inside your head, making you feel stressed out. But when you're like, when you're in a classroom and you're just focused on learning things, growing then it's you know you feel much more relaxed and you actually learn better when you're not stressed out about performing well on the that's test. true well let's let's get back a little bit to i did have an <laughs> answer for you jeff even though i'm not the oh, researcher. Yeah, yeah it's just, this is anecdote people so this is not research but i i can tell you that especially in large classes where i didn't feel fully accepted as a student which is like most of my life uh <laughs> as a student anyway, that I really cared about what other people thought about me. And so if I didn't 1000% know that the math answer was correct, there was no way it's going to open my mouth because it could lower my social status. Like I'd be some dumb kid. Mm. And that was a real fear that I had. And now I did open my mouth a lot because I was pretty talkative and I felt like it did have the right answers. But whenever I didn't, like I was terrified and I, th I do think there's a bit of a social aspect in terms of like if you really trust and are really familiar and have like a, a real strong affinity for the other students in your class, they have a lot more forgiveness for you. Like I think there's more space to be wrong and like for that, yeah. that not to like decrease your social status. Um, and so in different classroom environments, at least again, anecdote here, people please research this. I'd love to, I'd love to know, <laughs> but in some you classrooms, yeah, in some classrooms, I, and I think I really just kind of spread my wings in college. Cause I, I just didn't care. I was, 
for a lot of my time at U of H, like I was married. And so I really didn't care about social status anymore, <laughs> which that can be a different topic for another day. I just like, I didn't have to impress any of the girls. I didn't have to impress any of the guys. I, you know, kind of the professor, but that's kind of a given. And I could have my opinions and I stood by them and I was able to have some like really great discussions and, you know, as a history major and a philosophy minor, like all we're doing is like debating and arguing like, and, yeah. and doing, you know, basically grown up story hour, which is great and, um, had a lot of fun, but yeah, I, I didn't feel like my social status was a concern and I felt like my classmates trusted me and, and so I just, uh, I could share anything. And so I almost wonder if smaller class sizes or, you know, longer. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say to me, you know, because I studied political science and I feel like when you reach that realization that like your opinion, whether, you know, it's not about being right or wrong, but like your opinion matters. And um, once you realize that, it, it really changes the whole approach to education. Oh, I don't man, know, Alice, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Absolutely. Like picking up on, on what you said about like the feeling of acceptance. So in research, we talk about that as like the sense of belonging in your classroom mm-hmm. and in school, yeah. feeling that you're valued and appreciated and that you fit in with everybody and that, you know, that they, they appreciate what you have to say, whether it's correct or not. That's so important in school. And there's a lot of research that it's especially important for women in STEM too, because they get a lot of signals that they don't belong there especially like in, in college classes, like, you know, if there's only 20% women in the classroom, you know, you feel very, very self-conscious and you worry about whether you belong or not. And, and so a lot of my research is also on like, what can we do to make girls feel like they do belong, to make them feel like they are, you know, welcomed and valued and, and they, sh- they belong there. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about like the, the parent perspective on this. Um, because we know that cultural stereotype exists. Actually, I want to tell this story to you. Um, when I was in third grade, um, I was like really into climbing and and have had big broad shoulders and still still do. And my parents were like, look, I think you would be great at gymnastics. And they were going to sign me up for gymnastics. And I guess word kind of got out through my siblings or something. And this girl at recess kind of poking fun at me said, so I heard you're going to sign up for gymnastics. And that just like took the wind out of my sails. And I was like, you know, I guess I'm not going to do gymnastics anymore, which I didn't, which I wish I had. (laughs) So of course we know that we live in a world of cultural stereotypes. And I guess I kind of want to come at it from the perspective of a parent. Like if you have a, a child who you feel is gifted in this area or who has expressed in the past interest in STEM topics, but then they, they encounter these cultural stereotypes. Like what's your advice or your message to parents to, to overcome that? Oh, so, you know, that's a hard question because we do a lot focusing on like what, what can we do more like to change these stereotypes? So I guess as a parent, what you can do is try to expose your kids to, to you know, to people or to information that doesn't match the stereotypes, like show them people like them who are in STEM. And we talk about like female role models for girls in STEM. And I think that's, that is really, really important, but I think it's just as important that they find role models that they can relate to. So just like having a fun teacher who makes it really fun. It doesn't matter whether that's um, a man or a woman. And so as a parent, you know, finding every chance you can to sort of give those cues of that sort of work against the stereotypes. So sometimes I think about like, you know, we've got this big scale of like our culture and we're like adding all these signals on top of each other. And we're like weighing kids down with all these stereotypes. And so it's gonna take a lot to like counteract that and, you know, undo the effects of all these cues and signals that we send to kids. Um, And I think, you know, I think as a parent trying to give your kids early experiences in STEM is really, really important too, before they are aware of the stereotypes because then by the time they're aware of the stereotypes, they can be like, oh, well, that's not true because this was my experience or, you know, this is the experience of a kid in my class. So we did one research study. We do some studies with in Rhode Island because we work with the computer science for Rhode Island team to collaborate on research. And we did this study uh, with third through seventh grade students and we got our data back and there was something different about the fifth graders. It was like the fifth grade girls were all really interested in computer science 
And like everyone, the girls and the boys in fifth grade were all like, oh yeah, girls are way more interested in computer science than boys are. And we're like, this is strange, what's going on here? So we talked to the teachers and it turns out like that particular group of fifth grade girls was just a really strong girls academically. And so like they're in that classroom environment and they're excelling and they're not only like changing the way they see themselves, but they're changing the way that boys see women and girls in computer science. So yeah, I think it's so important that, like, at this early age, we have to get the girls in there because they're going to change the way they see themselves and it's going to change the way that the boys see them. And then that's like how we can change these stereotypes like from the ground up is like, you know, change stereotypes from an early age. And then as kids get older, they're going to, you know, keep, you know, resisting these stereotypes and, and changing them. And so by the time this generation grows up, we, things could look really, really different. I will say from a gymnastics perspective, I feel like that stereotype has, I mean, I don't know, cause I'm not in third grade anymore. Maybe girls are still <laughs> making fun of boys to do gymnastics, but I feel like it's kind of gone away. Like, um, we know a lot of kids who, who are in gymnastics and it's, it's kind of being accepted as like this thing that's great for fitness and flexibility and things like health. Um, whereas I don't know when I was a kid and it might've just been where I grew up, you know, it might've been my, my demographic. Um, but the stereotypes can change. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Know, 50 years ago, women weren't doctors or lawyers and now they totally are. So, yeah. So that's, that's, what's really exciting. I think about the STEM and, and, and your research, you know, you said 18% of women are, um, in these, these college programs for, for computer programs. Um, you've got to imagine that over time that stereotype is going to break. Mm -hmm. Are you, so you said you're focused on breaking the stereotype. Are you, are you more, would you say you believe more in changing the, changing the stereotypes overall or like working to fix the individual mindsets of the kids? Yeah. I think both. I think, you know, this is a problem that's complex. And so we, we like any way we can address it on any single level, I think is great. So, you know, if okay. you have teachers trying to counteract, if you have parents trying to counteract it and like getting kids to resist and fight back and protest, you know, that stereotypes are unfair. I think all of those things are good. I think, you know, in the media, like trying to get, you know, media sources just to be aware of what they're doing, you know, when they, when they do these things, like Barbie had that book about like Barbie does computer programming, but she got stuck. But then her friend who was a boy helped her solve her coding problem. <laughs> and I think there was a big uproar about that. And then Barbie was like, okay, fine, we'll change the book and we'll make it, you know, we'll make it clear that Barbie can do coding all on her own. So I think, you know, the more we can make media companies aware of things like that and to change their messages is really good. That's great. Yeah. And I think in, in Britain right now, they passed a law that commercials can't, um, you know, they can't be gender stereotypical anymore either. So like in order to show your commercial on the air, it has to be free of gender stereotypes, which I think is a great thing. I like that. So what do you think about stereotypes as a tool? I mean, to me, you can only look at the world through a certain level of resolution, right? Like, and you know, even if you try to delete it, and I agree that we should change these stereotypes, like you look out at the world and like you walk into a grocery store and you're looking at people, the first thing, maybe, okay, like maybe personal experience, right? But I'm just trying to determine safe, not safe, right? Who are these people? And then I'll, um, and then it's kind of just fun to people watch after that. But like, your brain is constantly making assessments and what it does is it, it groups people into groups so like people that wear hoodies, you know, people of certain races, people of certain ages, uh, people of certain genders. And those, these are things that happen automatically. And so it's a little bit difficult to fight sometimes because you're working against like literal biology and like the way your brain works. Um, but then if you like, we can don't do this people. But like if you were to walk up to someone in the grocery store and like, hey, I'd like to know your life story. You know, that's weird. Like they're obviously just picking up lettuce and going to the checkout. But uh, if you were to ask that, then you would you would go from like a pixelated, you know, very chunky level of resolution to like hyper resolution. Like, OK, this person likes gymnastics. They don't like coding. They 
you know, they listen to these podcasts, they have these political beliefs, they go to this church, they get, you know, like, they like, they really like this flavor of ice cream. And then a stereotype doesn't really apply because it's the person has replaced this, the stereotype. But the, the problem is like, if you only see the stereotype and you don't ever ask like those finer questions. And, um, and if like you say, Allison, that the stereotype prevents just the, the asking of questions, prevents the failure, prevents the trying, prevents like ever like getting into coding or STEM in general. Um, once, once girls are in, they love it. And that's in our classes. I don't see any kind of like girls don't like it when they're in there. If we saw that, we would like change something because <laughs> we don't want people to have a bad experience in our class. And so, yeah. So are you trying to build stereotypes? And a stereotype has like a very negative connotation, but are you trying to build like these lenses that like people are good at coding? Like, like mm -hmm. that, you know, Barbie can do it on her own or she can do it with the help of her girlfriends or her boyfriends or whatever. Like coding is collaboration, but um, what, ah, yeah, stereotype is such a bad word, <laughs> but like, what are you trying to build? And yeah. like, if, yeah. if, if you could have parents and, and young girls or boys, both, I mean, better if everyone's on, on board, right? What would be like, what would you want them to believe? Yeah. So, you know, if it's you so just hard had mind control, you just, right. It's hard to fight stereotypes because like, even if you give counter examples, then like we just subtype, we're like, okay, well maybe not all girls like computer science, maybe, maybe Asian American girls like computer science, but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that like other girls will too. Like, so we just like, we just keep categorizing people smaller and smaller to protect these, these stereotypes mm -hmm. and then information, you know, we pay attention to things that confirm the stereotypes and we forget the things that don't fit with our stereotypes so you know our yeah our minds play all kinds of tricks to protect yeah, these so it's like a it's you know it's got to be a cumulative thing where when you see a computer scientist you know if half the time you see men and half the time you see women over time that's going to start to you know help er erode that stereotype versus if every time you see a computer scientist on tv it's a man like if that's all you see then you're gonna then everybody like we make that link and that's just how we think about, if we think of computer scientists, we think of men. So you know, we have to do it like quantitatively, like the more counter examples you can do, like over time, hopefully they can add up too. And then I think we also have to just sort of like explicitly stop ourselves from acting on stereotypes and like fight against them. So like for, for kids in particular, like one good way to make them fight back against stereotypes is to talk about fairness. Like, you know, is it, you know, you ask a kid, is it fair if someone judges you based on the group that you belong to? And of course, kids will say, no, that's not fair. Right. And so then you can talk to them about like not judging other people based on the groups that they're part of as well. Because, you know, when we stereotype and when we like categorize people, it makes us focus on the differences between groups and it makes us forget about like how different people are within each group. So like, you know, not all boys like computer coding, mm -hmm. um, not all girls dislike computer coding. Like there's huge variation and there's huge overlap. Like the way we talk about these things makes us ignore, like, you know, in the middle of the Venn diagram, there's tons of boys and girls who love coding. And so. I would say we, most. Yeah. I would say there's, there's probably. <laughs> in our classes like and this is a biased sample right because these are people that signed up for coding right but we're also getting people that have never done coding before we're getting returning students but you know largely it's new students i'd say like le like fewer than five just don't like it they just you know we come at it from every angle and they just kind of don't like the angles they don't like the artistic animation graphics part of it they don't really like the math part of it maybe they don't like the social part of it. It's it's really, really few people. I mean, like, computers are a product of logical equations and technical innovation by humans, right? Like, so it's a creation of, of us as a, as a human race. And so, like, it would make sense that most people could get into that, especially if it's, it's accessible you know, with these tools that we use like scratch. So, I mean, I will say though, it is, it is 
challenging, James. Oh, for sure. I mean, it, yeah. it's a challenging not, topic. Not everyone's gonna, you know, get get launched to Mars from Elon Musk's rocket. I mean, like, not everyone's gonna be an astronaut. Not everyone's gonna be a, a career coder. But I think I literally think ninety nine percent of the population could get the basic principles of sequential logic, if then statements, coordinates, like isn't those concepts are so understandable with you know given enough time again like before in my example of running for president like yeah give me 10 years and i'll figure it out but <laughs> i don't know james i could do <laughs> because, it yeah, i i'm a little like, i think i'm too ugly <laughs> to be honest like i don't know if i could change that but i could change yeah, like you know some other the... things growing abraham um, weird yeah, that, get that, that ten help. gallon Not hat. That. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, I think one thing with coder kids is I actually started tracking gender, uh, and parents don't have to answer like not a required question, but um, it, if they if they want to reply with with the child's gender, that helps us. I think it helps us to understand those statistics and see like what we can do to kind of encourage more people to sign up. Um, you know, one thing we've done in the past is hold like exclusive girls only classes. They haven't been extremely popular, to be honest. Uh, unfortunately, I guess that's because only 25% of our enrollment is girls. But like there's organizations like Girls Who Code who are really taking, a, you know, that's their entire mission is like focusing on getting girls into, into STEM and coding specifically. But like, what do you think? to us and to many other organizations that are like us, like what, what do you think we can do to kind of be part of the solution to increase that number so that when we talk to you again in three or five years, maybe we can be closer to 50, 50. Yeah. So, you know, I have mixed feelings about like the girls only programs. You know, I think it's right. great that they give girls a space where they, you know, can feel comfortable where they feel like they belong completely in that kind of environment. But I also think when we, you know, when we separate kids by gender, it's like, you know, any way we segregate kids, it says we're segregating you by this characteristic that's meaningful and important. And there's, mm. there's a reason why we don't want you around the boys. And that's because gender is really important. So we're like reinforcing this idea that gender is a big deal. And so I think ideally, you know, we could get, you know, get boys and girls in the same classes and, you know, have the girls be changing everybody's stereotypes about who likes coding and who's good at coding. And you guys probably do things like this, but, you know, like signing up with a friend. Oh, yeah. Really way to get girls in. And, you know, then you get twice as many girls into the class. That's true. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, well, and, I and I, was... we've seen that. We've seen that in our classroom where, you know, two girls will sign up that are their friends. They sit right oh, next man. to each other. They love it even more. Yeah. They, oh my gosh. <laughs> and it's infectious too. Like I'll just be walking by and they'll be like chatting and it'll be often actually about the subject matter. Like oh, it's so, I'd say it's most such of the time. a creative topic. Yeah. As well. And so I think people underestimate how creative it is. Yeah. And they're sharing ideas and they're, they're like, well, you could do this. And it's like, well, I could do this. And, and, they they love to talk about the possibilities and making that happen. They'll share a code. It's great. And those that's actually, I would say, most frequently when I get a call from a parent that says, like, this is their favorite after-school program. Like, they all week they just wait for coder kids. Um, honestly, mostly come from mothers of moms who have a best friend in the class. Mothers like, of and, girls, is that what you meant to say? <laughs> mothers of moms. Mothers, mothers of, of yeah mothers of mothers, mothers of, of moms too, goodness gracious we probably we don't have many moms in our classes <laughs> a little bit too young <laughs> allison I, I feel like james got you off are you gonna say Sorry. something else about this topic well you know it's sort of i think there's a lot of misperceptions of computer science in our society um and one of them is that it's like you know it's solitary it's like a person sitting and coding at their computer all day long by themselves like just sitting and typing and that's you know, I, I don't think that's true. And I think, you know, but I think that kind of perception, you know, is, is feeds into, you know, it's one of those things that pushes girls out of computer science. So as much as we can advertise computer science as being social and mm. as something 
that you can use to help people, I think that makes a big difference for girls too. You know, thinking of apps you can design that you know, can make the world a better place. I think those kinds of applications of computer science are a good way to draw girls in. And telling stories, they love. But like, there must be something at the at the collegiate level that is that pushes girls away from pursuing the major. Like, let's say that they actually declare for computer science, maybe they had a great computer science class in high school, they declare for the major when they go to college, and then they get to college, they're surrounded by a bunch of guys who, and, and we hire them. So I'm again, I know that this is a stereotype, but I'm saying that in the college experience, we, we talk to a lot of guys and they do have like social, like I completely agree that computer science is a very collaborative art they work on teams. Yeah. You have leaders on the teams. Very social. Most of the time, it's not just you hunkering down and, and hacking out code. But in the college experience, I think that you get a lot of people who are kind of siloed a little bit. Um, maybe it's changing. But there are still a lot of kind of quirky personalities from the guys in the computer science program. And so do you see that? Or am I just, am I just spouting off something that's... And I'm speaking specifically about U of H since we do most of our hiring there, but like there are some quirky guys who are in the computer science program. I could kind of understand if a girl declares computer science and she starts going to some classes and maybe says, I don't really want to spend my whole college career around these guys. Shots fired. All right. We love, we love you, computer science college. No, I'm, I'm just asking your opinion about, <laughs> about college if, if, I'm, if I'm totally off base. I, I might be totally off base. I think there's definitely that perception, whether it's true or not. And I think the fact that the perception exists pushes girls and women away. And so we need to change mm. the perception. Yeah. One thing that I think is, is really interesting is looking at examples of colleges that have changed it, that have gotten a lot more women to enroll in their, in their computer science majors, like Harvey Mudd and Carnegie Mellon and the University of Washington, I think have all done really, really good jobs. And I think... I like to talk about Harvey Mudd because I think they did some really cool things. So they took their um, their introductory computer science course and they divided it into like two levels, like the black and the gold courses. And one was an introductory class for people who had coding experience already. So this is like, you know, like if you're a teenage boy and you've been like programming yourself and like you're really into it and you know a lot of stuff already, you go into that class. And if you're a complete beginner and you've never done any coding before, like probably most of the women who are signing up for these classes, they go into the other class so that they're, when you're in the classroom environment, all of a sudden you don't have a situation where, you know, maybe the, the young men who have all this experience already are like dominating the conversation and they're like, you know, raising their hands mm. first up and that everyone else in the class feels kind of intimidated or like they don't belong there or that they're behind. And so they sort of like protect that environment so that people feel more comfortable in that kind of environment. Yeah, I guess that's what I was trying to say is like, maybe there's changes that need to happen in curricula so that people feel like, hey, this is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be working on a lot of like group projects. We're going to be creating a lot of cool stuff. Um, and, and sometimes some of the feedback that I've gotten just hasn't been um, that that's necessarily always the case. So. Uh, um, but I'm, I'm really sure, you know, there's a lot of colleges and there's a lot of programs. I'm sure that, you know, people are trying to address this problem. So, yeah. The other thing that Harvey Mudd does that I really like is they send all their female computer science majors to the Grace Hopper conference of like women in computing every year. So like they get to go like make connections and oh, cool. you know, be, make friends there and find mentors and things like that. So they give them a really nice support. Um, network. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. James, any other questions? Yeah. Have yeah I mean, I, I did have, I did have a question. I think you would mostly answer this, Allison. Um, and that is that in uh, May, 2019, you gave a talk about social influences on STEM and motivation uh, mm -hmm. in young children. And the first kind of bullet point, at least like, I didn't watch the talk. Like I just saw that this bullet point that said that the first learning objective was to help people understand how social connections can boost children's motivation in the classroom. I'm guessing is that generalizable? Is that a word? Generalizable? Yeah, totally. 
Okay. So generalizability is a word. Allison knows all the words. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm just like second guessing myself. Yeah. Is it is this knowledge generi- generalizable to non classroom spaces um, or classroom similar spaces like ours, where they may or may not happen in a classroom, but the dynamics different. The student teacher ratio is different. Um, like more students are interacting with each other to complete projects. What are some of those things that you found that were really motivational? Is it, yeah, so. Yeah, it was, it was the, the cool thing about those research studies that I was talking about in, in that talk is that it was minimal social connections. Just the idea that you're connected to other people makes you more motivated to do something. So we did this like with preschoolers and um, we, we brought them into the room and we said, you're going to do this puzzle, but you're part of a team and your team has this special color t-shirt. So put on your t-shirt and go work on puzzles. And kids worked longer on it and they thought they were better at it than if they thought they were just doing the puzzle as like a person, as an individual. And mm. that's all it takes is just like the belief that you're connected to other people doing something. And that's super motivating for you. Um, and it, you know, it applies to the similar studies have been done with college students. Like this is like a lifelong process is like, if you feel like you're doing something with other people, it's more fun. It's more, you're more, it's more motivating. Um, uh, and when I was in grad school, uh, one of the other grad students was doing these um, studies where they asked people if you'd rather taste test salad dressing by yourself. No, no, it was taste salad dressing with other people or taste test chocolate by yourself. And more people chose salad dressing because they could do it with other people, hmm. even though chocolate would be like tastier. Like being able to do something with somebody else is more fun than having to do something alone. And and it applies even if it's just like the idea of doing it with somebody. And I think it's kind of like, like I don't know if you guys do book clubs, but. I shouldn't say this in this podcast, but my wife does. Okay. Okay. So she's like, she's sitting, your wife, she's sitting at home. She's reading a book by herself, but everybody in her book club is reading the same book. So it's like, she's doing it in parallel yeah. with and so like, even if she never goes to the book club's meeting, it was still more fun to read that book because she was like thinking of the other people who were reading that book. Maybe she was wondering what they thought about it. She was just, you know, it sort of had that social feeling, even though yeah. she's sitting by herself reading a book. I yeah, mean, that explains a lot of Twitch too, you know, yeah. like <laughs> most of the people are watching the, watching a game. They're not playing a game, but they're still having fun. They're feeling almost like they're playing the game and they're mm-hmm. feeling that social interaction for sure. And that's the difference between like Twitch and a YouTube video of someone who's like finished playing, right? There's actually a qualitative difference where on Twitch, they can actually like answer questions and answer chats that you will write in, um, depending on how big they are, how much money you donate, but smaller streamers, you can just chat in and they'll talk with you. And that's something that really excites me, you know, um, to, to see someone who's like, they'll just talk with me because it's something to do. And, and yeah, it's it's motivating for sure. Yeah, and I think it's like a universal like human characteristic. Like that's why we have this field of social psychology is because like hmm. we're social creatures. And you know, it's not it's not everybody all the time who want who'd rather do things with other people. Like sure, obviously there's like individual differences and like you know when I think of my own kids, there's one one of my kids is really motivated by getting to do things with other kids, and my other kid would probably rather just go do things her own way. But like overall, this is something that it's like a general way to increase motivation. So it applies in the classroom, out of the classroom, any kind of learning situation. I feel like it's um, free too. It, yeah. is, it is free. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. And you don't um, even have to really do it. You just have to feel like you're connected to people. Well, I think well, we actually thing- do do it, but yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah, yeah, we should. I think, I think we could definitely we could be better more. about expressing that we do it and and expressing that yeah so we'll have to talk to you off the air i'd love to i'd i'd love to talk about like actual strategies we can put into play because i i'm thinking about it and i'm jazzed because i'm thinking like oh yeah this would be really fun just to communicate with parents and to help them because they're often wondering like who else has signed up for this class what's their age what's that you know they'll ask me these questions yeah it's true because they want to know that their kid's going to have a good time that other people are doing the same thing. They don't want to be the first one to sign up for a class. And so, 
yeah it's one true. thing i was gonna say too is that i think i think we're gonna see a transition like a natural transition and obviously there's a lot of stereotypes and and cultural walls that need to be torn down uh in terms of the stem thing but another thing that i think is really interesting i'd love to get your opinion on allison is is the entrepreneurial revolution that we've seen kind of in the United States and among women, um, because I, I don't know, but I'm seeing it. I don't have any statistics, but it seems like women are starting businesses just so much these days. And when I think about entrepreneurship in the, in the modern era, coding is such a crucial part of entrepreneurship. You can literally learn to code and then you can start your own business with these tools. Have you have you thought about that at all? Like the impact that that could have? No, but you know, it also reminds me of like how like more women are running for political office too. That like women are starting to you know take on more leadership roles, and I think that's great. And hopefully, they're opening doors and like breaking glass ceilings. And I mean, and, it seems know. like yeah. I mean, it seems like the the transition out of some of these cultural stereotypes is. I'm not going to say it's natural. I'm not going to say there's not work to do. Um, there's work to do, but, um, it seems we're like we're getting, progress. things are getting better. Yeah. We're going to see kind of some natural changes. Well, maybe we'll perceive them as natural, but, um, but just because of, of the way that entrepreneurship is going and mm -hmm. people love to, are loving to start their own businesses and kind of work for themselves. And I know that for me, it's, it's a, definitely a motivator to say like, wow, if I like study coding, then I can start my own online business or you don't even necessarily need to, but it helps. So mm -hmm. anyway, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Allison, for taking the time with us. I think yeah. we've Thanks gained a lot me. of insights. Yeah. Um, and you guys can share links so I can send you like a link to my lab's website and we've made like infographics about girls. Please. And yeah, can yeah. you tell us about your lab really quick? The I am lab. Yeah, so it's the Identity and Academic Motivation Lab. So we study, you know, identities like gender and racial ethnic identities and kids' ident identification with STEM and how they affect kids' motivation in school. Cool. Yeah. We'll definitely link to that. Yeah. And we can put anything you Twitter. want in the description. So awesome. feel, People can yeah. tweet at Allison as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also, if people want to know about our research, anyone who sends me an email and asks to see one of my papers, I'll totally send you the PDF, even if you can't find it online. Okay. You can always academics. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We, we really look forward to partnering with you, you know, in the future, if that's possible. Yeah, and me then, too. And then we'd probably love to have you back on the podcast after we've, you know, after you've fixed put, it? Put some of this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, it's going to be interesting. Like, like, yeah, I feel like it'll be an evolutionary process yes. where it'll it'll get a little bit more fixed and a little bit more fixed. But it'd be interesting to put something in action and kind of report on it, right? To, yeah, to I want to hear, you know, if, when you learn about research, if you get an idea for research and then you put it into practice in your classes, I'd love to hear how it goes for you. Oh, for sure. Find effective ways to do it. Yeah. And, we're shooting, and here's we're the thing. For 50 50. Yeah. He, well, here's the thing. And we, we just want more people in general to sign up as well. But um, if you're a parent, which I'm assuming that's a primary demographic of people that listen to this podcast. So if you have a daughter and you have an idea of what would make them feel included, we talked about, you know, different things that could. But if you have a specific example, like, Again, it's not coming to me, which is why I need your suggestion, right? Like, if you have a suggestion, like, hey, doing, a, you know, this thing or Topics. doing that thing, whether it's a topic, whether it's a, like a mode of teaching, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's more collaborative play or, or, or who knows what, um, you can give me a call on the phone and say, hey, this would really help. And, you know, I have one or two girls that would like to sign up and, you know, if you can guarantee that, then I'd like to sign up. And I'd be like, sure, no problem. We're we're a small business. We're able to adapt. And, you know, these general principles are great. But, man, when I get something super actionable, I love it. And we're, we're able to kind of modify what we do. So, in fact, I had a mother call me this morning. And she signed up last night for our summer camps. And she's like, hey, can you do a web design class? 
in uh, the last week of August? And I said, yes, ma'am, you know, and we and as of right now, we have it posted on our website. So, you know, you parents have a lot of power and a lot of influence um, about what we do and how we do it. And so if there's something you like to see, let us know. Awesome. Other than Thanks that, again, Allison. yeah, like subscribe, please share with your, your fellow friends and uh, <laughs> that's it. We'll see you next week. Thanks.